And tell me a little bit about the history of CBTI specifically. When did the when when did the um, idea come to you know uh, e existence in a way that's that it's been packaged uh, more or yeah. less the way it is today? Yeah. So cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is actually old news. I mean, we can go back to the 1970s. I remember when I was learning cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. One of the most fun um, studies to read about was this study of, I believe it was college-aged men who were not doing well academically. And the intervention that they did with them was one of the two pillars of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which is called stimulus control. Mm -hmm. And what they did with these young men is they told them, all right, you're going to be assigned a carol in the library. And in this carol is the only place you can study. You can't study in your dorm. You can't study outside, can't study anywhere else, just this carol, right? And only this amount of time can you study each day. Even if, it, if you're on a roll, we don't care. You have to stop. If you're miserable, we don't care. You just have to keep on like doing whatever part, portion of the studying over and over again that you're stuck on, right? So they trained peop these young men to just study in that one place. And it succeeded in helping these men. And these men were struggling with anxiety or actual insomnia? Academically. They were, they were struggling with this, okay. this is just stimulus control. Yeah, got it. Where we learn to associate a place with, with a, a behavior. behavior. Yep. Right. And fast forward a little bit, one of, it was actually, it was called the Bootsin Method at one point for Dick Bootsin, but um, one of the hallmarks of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is your bed is only for sleep. There are two things you're allowed to do in bed. I always tell my patients, your two things that you can do in bed are sex and sleep. If you're not sure if something counts, message me and I'll, I'll clarify it for you real quick, whether it counts in one of those two buckets. But we really want to just associate the bed with sleep. And this dates even further back. And to be clear, uh, just going back to this study, mm -hmm. was, was, was there a belief or were some of these guys studying in bed? They were studying in their dorms, in their beds, and everywhere else. Got it. Okay. I mean, everywhere. Um, so this wasn't specifically a, a study focused on sleep per se. It was just studied. It was just focused on this associative pattern mm -hmm. that became the bedrock of this treatment. And we can go back even further, and we can look at Pavlovian conditioning, right? The dog and the bell and the food, and we don't need to go over that, what that whole thing was again right now. But the point just is that the dog came to associate the bell with getting food, right? And a lot of times when people are struggling with sleep, you know what they're doing in their bed? They're reading, they're scrolling, they're watching TV, they're listening to podcasts, they're, they're doing like everything. A lot of people, by the time they get to me, they're camping out in their bed just in case they're able to sleep. Oh, I'm going to go have a snack in bed because if I'm sleepy enough, I'll roll over and take a nap and I'll get some extra Z's, right? So people have moved so much of their lives into their beds that it's completely dissociated from sleep. So yeah. that's a major, that's one of the, the bedrocks, right? And then another bedrock is what we now call time in bed restriction. Mm. This used to be called sleep restriction, but I think, I don't know where along the way in the last number of years, it went from being called sleep restriction to time in bed restriction. But whoever made the change, I'm still not sure who made that change. I'm thankful to them for it. Because the other key component of CBTI is that we restrict the amount of time that a patient is in bed to match how much time their body can actually produce of sleeping. A lot of times people with insomnia will say, okay, I need to be in bed for at least 12 hours if I want to get seven hours of sleep. Right. I know it's hard to believe, but it's true. Um, and we just obliterate that notion. And this is another core and very old part of CBTI that dates back, what, seven, 1970s, 80s? But um, when you take those two parts, then you start to add in some of the cognitive components that have been around also for decades, the cognitive therapies part, the Aaron Beck stuff with cognitive restructuring, which is where we take a thought. Have you ever heard that phrase, don't believe everything you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you take a thought and on the classic classic thought record tool, you'll have patients write down the thought, write down how they feel, rate their feelings from say zero to 90%. 
And then we have them write down, what's the evidence for this thought? Like if you had to go to court right now and there was a judge and a jury and what have you, and you had to present evidence for your thought, what would you be able to present? Evidence for a thought is not another thought. It's not a belief. It's evidence. Last time I slept six hours, I got a worse grade on a test or something, right? That would be evidence. You, you got a worse grade on a test. But then we, so we look at all the evidence for a thought. We look at all the evidence against a thought. Like, oh, last time you didn't sleep so well, you didn't get fired. You still did fine in school, whatever the thing. And then we create a balanced thought, which is, okay, even though I'm not going to be as well rested, I'll still get through this day, right? And then we have people re-rate their emotions, re-rate how much they believe this new thought, this whole song and dance, right? This is the cognitive component. And that's kind of the bedrock of so much of cognitive therapy. And so, of course, people have so many negative thoughts about sleep and, and dysfunctional thoughts about sleep that aren't true or that are catastrophizing and whatnot, that that is also blended in to the treatment. Um, and then we have relaxation techniques, which are things like progressive muscle relaxation that came along as well. And those are part of the treatment. And that progressive muscle relaxation will be like where you squeeze your hands and let it go and squeeze your hands and let it go and then squeeze your arms and let them go and kind of move through your whole body to get out of your head and into your body. And I don't know what or what order those actually were packaged into CBTI. Um, but I can tell you the first two, the stimulus control and the, and the time in bed restriction, those were among the earliest earliest parts of CBTI. And what we know from dismantling studies is when you take w either of those out of the treatment, no dice. <laughs>